Why is shale gas development called by the industry unconventional? And the reason is, uh, from a geological point of view, is because the gas resource, in this case a shale, is highly impermeable and has low porosity. That's the classical definition of an unconventional resource from the industry point of view. From the practical point of view of regulation, legislation, and human impact, it's unconventional because it involves four relatively new technologies, all of which had to come together. How long did it take to get all these technologies to work together? How old, going back to this myth, they've been fracking for 60 years, so what? Okay. What's really new here? And how long did it take for all these technologies to come together? Well, here's the table out of the New York State uh, generic environmental impact statement uh, published late last year. Uh, the first horizontal well was drilled in the Barnett Shale in 1991. Slick water fracturing fluids were invented in 1996. Multi-stage slick water fracturing of horizontal wells, 2002, and the use of multi-well pads and cluster drilling, 2007. How old is this technology? Roughly five years old. Is it, should it make you feel comfortable that mythologically you think it's being done since 1947? No, it hasn't been done. One part of it, fracking, has been done since 1947, but the scale of fracking is now almost 100 times greater. And so you're really de dealing with an entirely new technology. So unconventional development of gas using high volume fracking from long laterals is not a 60-year-old well-proven technology. It's still under development. Ask any of the companies right now how much research they're supporting and how to figure out how to do this better. There's a lot of research being done by academic institutions, including some higher institution, institutions of higher learning in Pennsylvania, uh, where industry is going in and supporting that research by millions of dollars to try to figure out how to make it work better. It's not standard operating procedure yet. So what? Why is this an issue? Why is it important that this is a relatively new technology? I already mentioned one. You, you weren't ready. Your regulations weren't ready. Your regulators weren't, worried, weren't ready. Uh, you didn't have proper waste disposal facilities in place. I can go on from there, but the bottom line is there has been insufficient time to figure out what the impacts of all this are going to be or even what they have been. Second myth with a kernel of truth. Fluid migration from faulty wells is a rare phenomenon. It's true. It's rare. What's your definition of rare? Two percent? One in a thousand? Let's find out. Uh, you're looking at a wellhead. This is the part of the well that's coming out of the ground, and there's, inside of that is the production casing. The gas is supposed to be coming up inside that only. And uh, this bubbling water is in the so-called cellar of the well. That's a, an area that's been excavated out around the wellhead, which frequently fills with rainwater or snow melt. And that water now becomes a telltale. So what you're seeing is gas migration outside the well. So if gas migrates outside the well, it's possible that on its way up, it comes in contact with an underground source of drinking water. In other words, methane contamination of somebody's private water well. Even if it doesn't, it's now migrating directly into the atmosphere where it becomes a very potent greenhouse gas. I'll show you another example of uh, methane migration. So this has happened in a number of streams and in the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania. Um, so Chesapeake was fined $700,000 uh, for some of these um, egregious acts to trout streams. But the relevant thing is that the nearest gas well to this stream was 3,600 feet away. So this video shows everything's fine, the cement is intact, these molecules can't get through the cement, they can't get into the open annulus, therefore they can't get to the surface and cause bubbling. They can't get into the rock above and cause underground contamination. But there are many things that could go wrong, and I don't have time to tell you about all those things, so I'll just go show you a couple of them and then show you the one that they didn't show you, which is the most important one, of course. So one of the things that can happen, for those of you who know about cement, and everybody around here knows about cement, the cement goes down as a liquid, right? All right, so they pump the cement down the inside of the, of the casing, it comes all the way to the end, and then goes all the way back up, and it goes to a level called top of cement, and then it starts to harden. Except before it hardens, it's a liquid. And if it's in contact with a high pressure gas, what happens when you squirt a high pressure gas on liquid cement? Well, you get a mess, and you get what's called channeling. 
So you can get loss of contact between the cement and the rock, and now the cement is useless. It's really not there. It's not doing its primary job, which is sealing the annulus. That happens a lot. That's one thing that can go wrong. Another thing that can go wrong is you get a leak through the casing. The casing is not one long continuous pipe, it's jointed. Every joint is a weakness. And every once in a while the casing is produced faultily and it contains cracks or it can crack because it can get overpressurized. And if the casing fails, then you can get gas coming out and going to the surface uh, where it can either go into the atmosphere or build up pressure and go into an underground source of drinking water. Uh, you can have a poorly designed well, which is what happened in Dimmick and most of the wells. Uh, they never got the cement to the top that they wanted to, so they had pressure, pressurized gas from shale formations above the Marcellus getting into an open annulus and going up to the surface. So again, there's a lot of cement knowledge in the Lehigh Valley, right? Uh, how long does it take cement to cure? How, how long does it take to go from liquid to solid? Well, no, I don't mean strength. I mean to, when it goes from liquid to solid, a few hours, right? Depending upon the additives. You can delay it, you can accelerate it, depends upon temperature, all kinds of things. But what happens is that some engineer has to make a judgment. The cement engineer has to make a judgment because if the cement takes too long to cure, they have to shut down the whole operation while they're cementing. Nobody else can do anything. And it takes many, many dollars per minute to be developing a gas well. So they don't want the cement to take too long to cure. What happens if the cement solidifies before it comes all the way back up? That's called lockup. Uh-oh, the cement didn't get to where you wanted it to go. And that's what happens again frequently. So instead of the cement top being up here and then forming hopefully a, a good barrier so that these molecules can't get into that open annulus, you have an open annulus totally open to gas pressure and now the gas goes wherever Mother Nature says it can go. Now, the most common problem here is not shown. And it doesn't, I want to make sure you understand this because there are millions of dollars being spent by the oil and gas industry on television ads and on newspaper ads right now that want you to believe that four layers of steel and four layers of cement are better than three layers of steel and three layers of cement. And three layers of steel and three layers of cement are better than two layers of steel and two layers of cement. And they want you to know that they're now using up to four or five or six layers of steel and cement. doesn't make a damn bit of difference. There's always an outermost layer. There's always an outermost layer. I don't care how many you have, there's always a contact layer between the cement and the rock. And that's the contact, that bond, they can't detect it, they can't measure it, they can't observe it. There are techniques for figuring out whether the cement is in contact with the casing, with the steel casing. Lots of good technology to tell them that. But what they can't tell is whether there's good bond between the outside of the cement and the inside of the rock. And by the way, it's not just one kind of rock. You might be seven or 8,000 feet down. There could be hundreds of different kinds of rock, each of which has its own chemistry, its own coefficient of friction, its own bonding chemistry with the cement. And you've got one kind of cement that you want to bond to all those different kinds of rock. So it doesn't make any difference. That is disingenuous on the part of the industry to say, we're now using more steel and more casing to give you more protection. Totally irrelevant. Doesn't make a damn bit of difference. Look, young wells fail at the rate of one in 20. Young wells, brand new wells fail at the rate of one in 20. Remember that number, 5%. And as wells age, the failure rate goes up because that cement starts to degrade. There are ground motions that cause the cement to crack. The, crack, the cement shrinks over time. Um, the casing starts to corrode, uh, the degradation between the casing and the cement goes to hell, the degradation between the cement and the rock goes to hell, and pretty soon more than half of your wells are leaking. Well, a reasonable expectation is eventually all wells lose their integrity. So the myth is fluid migration from faulty wells is a rare phenomenon. They'd like you to believe it only happens once in a million times, once in a thousand times, once in ten thousand times, but there are going to be a hundred thousand wells in the Marcellus in Pennsylvania. That's what most ex experts say, in the Marcellus alone. So the truth is that fluid migration from faulty wells is a well-known chronic problem, and there's an expected rate of occurrence. If you're going to have 100,000 wells, you're going to have 6% of those wells, 60,000 wells, is that right? 6,000 wells, okay, are going to fail. Uh, how many people's well water contamination incidents is that going to cause, and what's the cost to the state? 
So health impact, there will be contamination. There has been and there will continue to be contamination of underground sources of drinking water uh, with methane, perhaps drilling fluids, released hydrocarbons and other things that are down there that are supposed to come up the inside of the well and come out the outside. So truth, myth, you decide. All right, so natural gas is a clean fossil fuel is a true statement. When you compare how much carbon dioxide is put into the atmosphere by burning mass equivalent amount, mass equivalent amounts of coal, oil, and natural gas. Natural gas emits much less carbon dioxide per unit mass. So it's a true statement compared to coal and oil. And if you only talk about what happens when you burn it, and you only talk about carbon dioxide, that's a true statement. So should we ignore the rest of it? No. Here's the important point. Unconventional gas development produces much more methane in the form of purposeful and accidental emissions than does conventional gas development. Conventional gas development, remember, a few tens of thousands of gallons of flowback, the flowback period is a few hours. On an unconventional well, three or four million gallons of flowback, flowback period 10 to, 10 to 15 days. During that flowback period, many companies just vent the gas into the atmosphere. This is a still photograph taken of a well that's being finished, that is, during the flowback period. Uh, this piece of heavy, heavy equipment is here for scale. Naked eye shows water vapor coming off the pad, but the naked eye can't see methane. Methane is colorless, odorless, tasteless. You can't see it with the naked eye, but as you saw in Gasland last night, if you have a FLIR camera and you tune the FLIR camera to the wavelength of absorption of hydrocarbons, you can see hydrocarbons. So I'm going to show you a video right now, and in this video, anything that you see is yellow is a hydrocarbon. So it's false color. But this is what you can't see with the naked eye. So in this case, the company chose not to use a reduced, a reduced emissions completion. They chose not to have a gathering line in place during flowback. They chose not to flare. Companies can do any of those three things, but each one has an economic cost associated with it and an environmental impact associated with it. They chose just to vent. Okay. And so that methane, uh, millions of cubic feet per well, is going into the atmosphere. And there's the piece of equipment just to give you a scale. This isn't just a little puff. These are billowing clouds of methane. Uh, this is our estimate at Cornell of the effect of both burning the stuff and its effect on methane emissions, the stuff being shale gas, conventional gas, coal, diesel oil, the higher the bar, the worse. So this is the carbon dioxide that's emitted. That's the black. Blue is the carbon dioxide emitted through all the equipment that's necessary to get the stuff out of the ground. Uh, the pink is methane emissions. And so we have a lower estimate and an upper estimate. Our lower estimate makes unconventional gas dirtier than coal or oil. And the industry doesn't like to say us, does not like us to say that. And they're doing everything they can to discredit us personally and discredit our science. And yet every paper that's appeared in the last couple of months seems to support what we predicted. Of course, there are the papers that come out from certain places that are not peer reviewed or places that come out from peer reviewed journals from scientists who are supported directly by the gas industry that seem to take uh, offense of our science, but that is what it is. Final comments. Why is high volume fracking from long laterals a higher risk to human health? Clustered pads, multi wells, number of wells and volume of waste increase, probability of accidental releases of hazardous materials into the air and groundwater increases. No one yet knows the cumulative effects of this new technology, this new industry in a region, say statewide. Uh, and the increased production, processing, storage, compression, dehumidification, and pipeline transport of this stuff results in the exacerbation of climate change. And if you want more reliable information, then here are two places that I suggest you go. Um, so we organized our own website a couple years ago, pschealthyenergy.org, only high quality vetted information on this website. And you probably all know about the Oil and Gas Accountability Project out of Earthworks. Uh, those would be my two recommendations for places that you go for more high quality information. Neither of these are blog sites. Neither of these are publishing stuff which is uh, anonymous. So thank you.